So let me ask you, you ever been in a storm before? Yeah. Someone once said you're either in a storm, going to a storm, or coming out of a storm. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, it seems a little bit pessimistic, but the truth is that there are a lot of storms in our life, or at least we feel that way. The last few weeks we dealt with Noah and his storm and the storm of judgment. Then we dealt with Jonah and Jonah's storm of alarm clocker to wake him up, to get him to place of repentance. And now we deal with the storm of the disciples in the boat, or my boat is now full. Seems like I can't take anything else. Disciples make that claim. This is one that I think in all of us can identify with. Where Jesus put them in a storm and now they feel like, boy, what do we do? You see, before Jonah's storm, Jonah had said, God, I don't want to do that, right? He had turned his back. He said, God, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish. He had went down. He had paid passage, paid a fare for a boat, found other people with him. And, and, and you could see that his steps leading to that. But do you know where the disciples were before they got in the storm? We find the same account in Matthew. And it was shortly after he'd finished, Jesus had finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. They had just listened to Jesus preach. It would be like not that you, you know, have a problem with a flat tire or an illness because you've just spent the whole weekend at the bar. It's like you leave church and you get a flat tire. Right? And you can't help but think, but Lord, I just came from church. Fine, I'm not going back tonight if that's the way you treat me. But are we not guilty of some of those thoughts? Are we not guilty? Man, Lord, I just spent this much time reading your word and this is what happens? Fine, fine. Then I'm going to go the other route instead. The disciples had just finished spending time with the Lord. They had just finished serving with the Lord, listening to the Lord. And the Lord said, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And they said, okay. He promptly climbs in the back of the boat and falls asleep. And they promptly have a great wind, a mega wind, a mega storm come along. This concept has prompted many ideas. One of the prominent ones is, why do bad things happen to good people? There's a book by that same name written by, I believe, a, a rabbi. And in that book, it's fairly pessimistic, which is basically, hold on, we don't know, it doesn't, you know, it'll, it'll be okay in the long run. But I, I think if we're honest, we've had that thought, I've had that thought, man, why do bad things, you know what, I see this, this particular sickness for this person, and I can think of a whole lot of worse people that ought to be sick than this nice person. I see this person that maybe has this, this bill, this financial problem. I remember a pastor that I knew up, up in the Upper Peninsula. The man was a good man. He just had terrible financial problems. Terrible. I mean, practically broke, and I didn't broke, I mean literally practically broke. I can think of a whole lot of worse people to make broke than a pastor of a small church in the Upper Peninsula. Right? I can give you a list. I can give the Lord a list if he wants one from me. But he hasn't asked me for a list yet. And we have these thoughts, you know, why do these bad things happen to good people? And, and I believe that's part of the reason that the Lord included this story in the Scripture to help us, help you and help me as Christians to say, listen, what is going on? James deals with this in the book of James, chapter 1. The trying of your faith worketh patience. We know the perspective, but we get, so, we get so discouraged, so confused inside of it. And so I want you this morning, look at just three aspects of this storm. And then tonight finish up this storm where, where the morning is, my boat is now full. I want you to notice something as we begin this storm, and I really believe sets in motion the biggest problem in this, in this account. The biggest problem is not the great wind. The biggest problem is not the great waves. The biggest problem, I believe, you find in verse number 36 of chapter number 4 of Mark. The scripture says this, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Who is the him there? Help me here. They took him. Who, who's him? Jesus. Who's the they? The disciples. So who sent them across the, the, the sea was Jesus, but who took Jesus across the sea? The disciples. What you notice, I believe, right here, is you see, first of all, self-reliance. Self-reliance. Jesus said, let's go across the other side, and they took Jesus. You know why? They're fishermen. They know how to sail a boat. This is where Jesus had called them from when he called them to be his disciples. He called them from their boats and cleaning their nets. They had sailed before. Boy, this used to be their livelihood. 
They'd sailed across the Sea of Galilee, I'm sure, many, many times. This was not a secret. This was not a surprise. This didn't take anything except, hey, listen, we know how to do this. All right, get Jesus in the boat. We got to go across. Okay, Jesus, hold on. We'll get you. We'll get you. They took him. And they put Jesus in the boat and they cast off and they're sailing right along. And everything's going a okay but they were doing their own thing. They had traveled through storms before. There was no way that this was the first storm ever on the Sea of Galilee. In fact, if you study about this, storms can whip up very quickly on the Sea of Galilee. And so I'm sure they had sailed through storms as, as any sailors have. And I'm sure they had sailed through storms before. And they didn't care where Jesus was in the first part of the trip. Did they? No. Where's Jesus? I don't know. We don't need Jesus right now. Because we got this. We don't need Jesus. I can sail this boat without Jesus. We don't need Jesus. I'm a sailor. It's what I used to do. Thankfully, God called me to serve him because, I mean, he needed a sailor right now, and that's me right now. So, Jesus, you got a good deal when you got me. Good thing you called us. We can do this. And they didn't even worry about Jesus. When they started the trip, they launched the boat. They rowed. They moved the sails. They were experienced. The problem is we try to live life without the Lord. You see the correlation you saw before I got there, didn't you? We can get in our car all by ourselves. We don't need the Lord. We can, we can work a job without the Lord. We've got this. Lord, you got a good deal. Listen, I've got this. And we have this idea of self-reliance. I saw this definition of self-reliance on the internet. Knowing and trusting that you will be there when you need you most. Knowing and trusting that you will be there when you need you most. But may I submit, Christian, that we often have that mentality. That I need to be there when I need myself the most. I can be strong through this. I'm going to buckle down and, you know what, I'll just grin and bear it this morning. I got, okay, all right, I know life's rough, but I'm going to paste a smile on my face. No one's going to see the pain I have. You know, and I'm not saying that we have to walk around with a grumpy expression on our face. I'm not saying that whenever anyone asks you how you're doing, that you go into all your medical bills and medical trials. Right? There's times for that, but it's not every service, every introduction to every person you meet in handshaking time. You with me? But at the same point, we're not made to live life all alone. We're not made to sail the sea of life without someone else at the helm. And the first problem and the biggest problem I see in this passage is self-reliance. I have this statement, don't get caught in self-reliance. It's a sure recipe for disaster. Don't get caught in self-reliance. It is a sure recipe for disaster. You find it all over in the worldly philosophy. Patricia Sampson said, self-reliance is the only road to true freedom, and being one's own person is its ultimate reward. I hope that me being my own person is not the biggest reward I get in life. What a disappointing reward that it's just me. I know me. What a letdown. Yet we live our life that if I do this, that's the biggest success I have in life. I think my wife said amen to that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Now, it kind of sounds good at first, that psycho babble. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Oh, I will bring myself peace. Mm, I'm now at peace with myself. Tell that to the disciples in the middle of the storm. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself, Peter. Bring some peace right now, Peter. How's that peace going? Right? Come on, John and James, Andrew. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Bring some more peace to your life. They had no peace. They couldn't bring any peace, could they? But they thought they could do this. They thought they could sail this. They even thought they could outsail the storm. See, they didn't go get Jesus when the first wind started beating up, did they? Oh, yeah, we've seen this before. Okay, guys. All right, batten down everything down. Tie it down. We're going to have a little bit of rough water here. Don't worry. We got, right? They didn't call Jesus when the wind started to blow. They still had this. Do you see the self-reliance in this passage? Can you identify with that? They only got Jesus when the boat was full. But until that point, they're doing it all themselves. One lady said, you are the most important person in your life. So take time every day to restore your vitality. Self-reliance. 
And I promise you, if you want to ruin your life, just live it yourself. If you want to ruin your marriage, just live your marriage like you know how to. If you want to ruin your kids, just raise them like you want to raise them. If you want to ruin your finances, just spend it all by yourself. Just think through it very carefully. Don't include the Lord, all right? We can save him for the disaster time. And and just make those decisions and write the checks and swipe the card and and give and, and and do it yourself. The surest recipe for disaster. Self-reliance. You say, well, would they have known to ask Jesus for help? I ask myself th- that question. Where was this in the, in the ministry? You don't have to turn there, but if you read just in Mark, and this is the fourth chapter of Mark, all right? There are another eight after this. If you read just the first four chapters of Mark, you find in, in chapter number one, in verse 23, that a man with an unclean spirit, a demon, needed Jesus. Disciples were there, and they watched Jesus cast out a demon. He came to Jesus for help. If you continue to verse number 30 of Mark chapter 1, you'd find that Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and Jesus came and healed her. So, they, so Peter came and said, we need your help because wife's mom is sick. Came to Jesus then. Four verses later, Mark chapter 1, verse 34, there were divers diseases and casting out of devils, and they needed Jesus for that. And in verse number 40, and this is all in chapter 1, a leper needed Jesus. So just in chapter 1, in the space of about 17 verses, we see a demon, diseases, Peter's wife's mother, and a leper all coming to Jesus. They all needed Jesus, but not the disciples. They didn't need Jesus, did they? They're sailing this boat. They were caught in the trap of self-reliance. The problem is we run to Jesus in a storm and ignore him in the calm. While the sea was calm, we didn't need Jesus. While we could see the goal, we didn't need Jesus. Well, we could do it ourselves, we need Jesus. But once the wind and the waves came, we asked him, one of the hardest times to trust God is in the easy times. When the bills are paid, the kids are healthy, the car, knock on wood, is still running just fine. You get a tax refund from the IRS. You get a promotion at the job. The doctor says, you're as healthy as a horse. I went to the doctor when I was 23 years old, came out of college. My doctor said, why are you here? And I said, well, I figured I was supposed to come to the doctor. I haven't been for like 15 years. She goes, J.D., you're healthy as a horse. Come back when you're 40. I said, is that, you know, is that a fat joke? I'm a horse? She didn't answer that question. You and your spouse are doing nothing but whispering spree- nothings in your ear. Who needs Jesus then, right? But my Bible says, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not to thine, help me, own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. One of the hardest times to trust God is in the easy times. This last week we went down to Tennessee for a volleyball tournament down with uh, Brother Aaron Swain, Pastor Aaron Swain and Brother Bill Swain. Girls played well. On the way back, we got in the car, and, we, and my wife prayed, Lord, give us safety on the way home, like we often do when we get in the car. Not always, but often pray for safety, Lord, and we prayed. And As I was preparing this message, I thought back to that trip. On that trip back, the Lord gave us smooth sailing on the way back. But we had, it was just a few hours or so down the road, and left-hand side, there was an accident that was backed up for three and a half miles. So we're driving past these cars, and you think, boy, I'm glad that's not me. Anybody ever thought that when you see that traffic on the other side? And then you see the cars that are coming into it that haven't stopped yet. Maybe you're not like I am. You're probably not, hopefully, but you have that thought. Oh, you have no clue what's coming. I'll oh, just wait. <laughs> oh, right there it is. Shortly after that, we got slowed down a little bit, and there was an accident on our side. We passed probably within, honey, what, about a minute, minute and a half of the accident. There was a tractor trailer that was hit by a car and the tractor-trailer diesel tank was spilling diesel onto the highway. All right, he was on the shoulder at that point, but it was just leaking now into this lane. It was, I mean, I saw that the diesel was still coming out when we passed by there. Guy was still in his car over here. It makes you stop up and think, wow, Lord, a minute this direction, a minute that direction. It wasn't another couple miles down the road that there was on the other side an overturned vehicle, upside-down SUV with a trailer and a tractor, like a John Deere tractor on its side. So don't tell me we don't need God's help even to drive. But how many times have I gotten to my car and I'm just coming to work 
It's under three miles, actually 2.8 miles from my house. I don't need Jesus for 2.8 miles. I need him for 600 miles. But we're all guilty of that. I don't need Jesus right now. It's, it's a little thing. It's calm. And we get caught in the trap of self-reliance. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2 says, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My health cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, Jesus said, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The first problem I see in this storm is the problem of self-reliance. Now I'd submit that often in our storms we are there because of self-reliance. Don't be self-reliant because self-reliance always leads to self-ruin. The second thing I think I see is self-ruin, which is the title from this message. Now the boat was now full. Matthew, the same account, tells us now the, the ship was covered in waves. That caught me because sometimes in life our boat feels really full. Sometimes in life, you feel like, I can't do anything else. I can't go on. I can't handle any more, Lord. My boat is tipping over. My boat's sinking, Lord. Where are you? The disciples in their self-reliance were now in a spot of self-ruin. We always make a mess of things when we do it ourselves. The disciples made a mess. Where were they? In this storm, they felt like they were about to sink. They'd made a mess. In our life, there are times that we get overwhelmed. In our self-reliance, we just can't take any more and we're ruined. I found this, this little thing about ten signs that we're overwhelmed. It's not humorous, so I'm not, you know, it's not a joke. It's true, though. There are times in our life that we're overwhelmed and, and there's listless of this that you find that negativity is creeping in on life. Everything is negative. When we're overwhelmed, we, we see life through these this jaded glasses and everything is bad, everything is sad, everyone's a cheat, everyone's a liar, everything's terrible and, and life can never get better. You talk to someone on the stage and you say, hey, you know what, how's tomorrow going to be? Terrible. Hey, you have a good night's rest? No. No. You, 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 how's it going? Eh, not, not real good. Not real good. Well, you're looking better. Yeah, right now. Right now. Wait about five minutes. Right? Hey, you know what? What a blessing. You got to raise at work. Yeah, if I have a job tomorrow. Hmm. Negativity creeps in when we're overwhelmed. Nothing is easy. Decisions seem to be impossible. Oh, I don't know what to do, and anything I do is just going to be bad. Agitated all the time. Life is turbocharged. People are in pain. Illness is ever present. Life is everything. You see self-harm habits, too much eating, too much whatever, sleeping, and whatever it may be. Happiness is elusive, and sleep is, a, is usually impossible. All that equals that my boat's now full. Just like the disciples said, my boat's now full. And I would dare say, if we live longer than a day in this life, we've come to the point where we feel like, Lord, my boat is now full. And we've been self-reliant. To be honest, we've been living life apart from the Lord. Even as a Christian, we know we're saved. But I've been walking, I've been talking, I've been working, I've been raising my kids, living my family, all on my own, and now my boat's full. And disappointment has set in. My dream job ended up being horrible. My perfect boss is actually bipolar. My marriage was going great, but now the honeymoon period's over and I feel like I'm barely holding on. The perfect house I found the perfect house, and now it's just a, a pit of money. You have a house like that? The car I used to love now spends more time at the mechanic shop. The clothes that were the best deal in the world <clears throat> now hang in the closet because they don't fit any longer. And the vacation, it rained the whole time. Depression sets in. And really what people say at that point is, we've lost all hope. The disciples at this point had lost all hope. But understand this idea, we will always be overwhelmed when Jesus is underused. We'll always be overwhelmed when Jesus is underused. Where was Jesus? He's asleep in the back of the boat. He wasn't being used at all. 
He wasn't being talked to. He wasn't being asked questions about it. They didn't ask him how to sail the boat because they knew how to sail the boat. They knew how to travel this storm. They didn't ask him what they should do, all right? He was underused, so they were overwhelmed. And we will always...